It's Monday, April 25th, 2011. In this week's Speaker Beat, slumping sales aren't the only thing keeping Big Pharma up at night. Generics are winning a critical battle of the mind. We'll explain. Plus, could the medical device tax be having an unexpected negative impact on some regions? More on that. And a breakthrough brings us a step closer to a real bionic man or woman. All that and more on this week's edition of Beaker Beat, brought to you by Daiichi Sankyo. To learn more about Daiichi Sankyo, visit their company webpage on Beaker.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Beaker Beat. I'm Mike Justice. Thanks for tuning in. We are at the beach. Surf competitions going on. We'll have great shots of surfers for you throughout the show. But first, our top story, and it's no day at the beach for drug makers. U.S. drug spending grew at a paltry 2.3% in 2010, which alone would be enough bad news for the industry. But for drug makers, there's even more to worry about. In 2010, generics accounted for the top 10 most prescribed drugs. That data compiled by IMS Healthcare Informatics. In fact, only three branded drugs made the entire top 25. The Wall Street Journal Health blog reports that those three drugs, Pfizer's Lipitor, the Santa Fe Aventis BMS blood thinner Plavix, and Merck's Singulaire, are set to lose patent protection by next year. The drug with the most prescriptions by a country mile was the painkiller Vicodin. Over 131 million scripts were handed out by pharmacists for that drug in 2010, a stunning 37 million more than the second place drug, a knockoff of Merck's cholesterol drug Zocor. Meanwhile, the IMS report illuminated another scary piece of news, for branded drug makers at least. Generics capture the market for a particular drug much more quickly than they did in the past. Within six months of a patent loss last year, generics had taken more than 80% of sales volume from the branded version. Just four years ago, generics were only able to grab 55% of the market within six months. So it seems the public has decided going generic is okay. So tell us what you think about this story or any story that you see in today's show. Very simple. Click on the orange button below me. Box will pop up. Type in your comment. Send it to me. I promise I'll read and respond to every one of them. And I am not getting out there on a certain point. And when you're done watching Beaker B, check out Beaker's blog, where we give you the details of Sanofi's plans for Genzyme now that the deal is complete. That story and more on Beaker's blog. The medical device tax imposed by Obamacare may force medical device manufacturing to head for the hills, so to speak. The health care reform law and its excise tax on device sales is already driving companies to seek lower cost areas. That according to Princeton, New Jersey based research firm, The Boyd Company. The report examines the cost of doing business in 55 cities for a hypothetical 175,000 square foot production plant employing 325 workers and shipping domestically. Factoring in wages, benefits, utilities, state and local taxes, and shipping, it compares medical device cluster cities with other potential locales. Sioux Falls was the cheapest of all the American cities examined, at annual costs of $22.6 million. The same company would pay $6 million more per year to do business in greater Boston. The most expensive area, according to the report, is the San Jose, Palo Alto, California area. Pfizer and China's Shanghai Pharma are expanding their collaboration. First, the two companies plan to beef up their promotional efforts on Pfizer's Prevnar pneumococcal vaccine. They've also signed a memorandum of understanding on another innovative Pfizer product covering everything from Chinese government approval to distribution. Pfizer and Shanghai are also talking about manufacturing, R&D, and distribution cooperation, which also might include an equity investment. Valiant Pharma may decide to take their ball and go home. Valiant claims it will walk off if it doesn't get backing for 50% of Cephalon investors by May 12th. But like most children prone to tantrums, they can be talked out of it, if shareholders elect enough of its nominees to make a majority on Cephalon's board. Then its $5.7 billion buyout offer might just stay open. The FDA will soon issue guidance on labeling and development of combination diagnostic therapeutic products, known as companion diagnostics, which are now regulated on a case-by-case -case basis. The document is written and is now going through the clearance process. St. Jude Medical said it has received FDA approval for Trifecta, an aortic replacement valve made of bovine and porcine pericardial tissue. The approval news comes as the company reports that it posted $1.38 billion in revenues during the first quarter. The FDA has approved Roche's Cobus HPV test designed to identify women at risk of developing cervical cancer. The diagnostic can detect the 14 types of human papillomavirus out of more than 200 types that are associated with cervical cancer. It can also establish whether patients have one or both of the two likeliest types of HPV to lead to the cancer. A veteran GSK drug developer and a Chinese real estate magnate have teamed up to launch a new biotech called Escletus. 
Armed with $100 million in venture funds, one part will be in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and the other in Hangzhou, China. The company will focus on developing new therapeutics for cancer and infectious diseases. While mergers and acquisitions are exciting when they happen, there is a price to pay when the dust settles, usually in the form of layoffs. Employees at Genzyme Genetics, recently purchased by LabCorp of America for $925 million, are now facing layoffs. Word just came down that 169 jobs would soon be cut. How do you judge surfing? Is it just because they stay up on the board? I don't understand. Checking money matters now and lots of quarterly results to pass along. J&J profits may have fallen, but earnings per share came in at a buck thirty-five, nine cents better than expected. Plus, the company raised its full-year earnings forecast. Overall, sales grew 3.5% to just over $16 billion. Abbott sales grew with the help of its Humira arthritis drug, which rose by 18% to $1.65 billion. Generic sales in emerging markets boosted global revenue by 17.4% to $9 billion. Amgen profits dropped 3.6% in part by declining sales of its anemia drugs and a higher marketing budget to support the osteoporosis treatment prolia. Biogen's earnings grew 35% to $294 million thanks to better-than-expected to Sabri and Avonex sales. Together, they helped spur revenue growth of 9% to $1.2 billion. Gilead Sciences' profit fell a whopping 24%, disappointing analysts and shareholders, I'm sure. A key reason? Cash-strapped state governments have cut back on buying Gilead's key AIDS drugs. Covidian's medical device division posted a 16% increase in sales during its fiscal quarter, driven by its acquisition of EV3 and Somanetics in 2010. I need a kid on the way. Anybody. Help a brother out. As a kid, the bionic woman was a staple of my post-school day early afternoon television diet. Lindsay Wagner fantasies aside, I always thought it would be cool to have a bionic body part. Ear, eye, legs, whatever. Now, a new finding published in JAMA shows we are one step closer to building a $6 million man. And more like a $60 million man when adjusted for inflation. Scientists at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago's Center for Bionic Medicine found that lower leg amputees can train a computer avatar to learn certain movements using electrodes that record electrical signals from their leg muscles. The findings suggest that amputees can be fitted with an experimental robotic prosthesis without having to undergo surgery to attach additional nerve fibers to better control the artificial limb. Most prosthetics work now with mechanical sensors, but this new approach measures the actual neural intent and tells the motor what to do. Now, researchers fully expected patients to be able to operate the knee joint, but were surprised they could control the ankle without needing surgery. Prosthetic arms have already been developed, but a robotic leg would give lower limb amputees a new kind of freedom, allowing them to climb stairs safely and with more natural motion. While they say it's too early to tell how long before a bionic leg is available, it's still very exciting to think we soon could have bionic men and women fighting all those evil fembots. That's it for this week's edition of Beaker Beat. I'm Mike Justice. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Now it's time to go for a swim, because I'm really hot. Sit, Beaker. Sit. Good dog.